All right, so we are in uh, Mark chapter 12, beginning at verse 18. We'll be reading verses 18 through 27. And Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when, for when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the, dead, for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, just give us grace to be able to uh, understand this passage, to be able to believe and, uh, and, and obey it, to live it out. So uh, bless us now, Father. Give everyone uh, attentive hearts to, to your word. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, again, it's ironic today, or better yet, divine providence perhaps, that in light of today's passage, we were able to worship the Lord through baptism, celebrating a person who has been brought from death to life. As we spoke of earlier, that is why the Lord commanded us to baptize, to immerse someone underwater and then raise them back up. It is a picture of, of someone who has gone from death to life through the saving work of Jesus Christ. The scriptures teach that we were all once dead in our sin, which left us unable to, to, to know God or to, to love and submit to Him. But for all who put their trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, the Bible teaches that a transformation takes place. We are given new life through the power of God's Spirit. And this new life is both spiritual and physical. It is certainly physical, but also certainly spiritual, but also physical. It is spiritual in that our hearts and souls are changed so that we love God and we believe in Him. But as we all know, as we age, we are slowly dying. But in Christ, we are promised that though we die, yet we will live. That there is an afterlife. And not just a spiritual after, afterlife like a bunch of ghosts kind of floating around. There is going to be a real physical resurrection from the dead, where our bodies will be transformed into eternal physical bodies that never grow old or sick or die. In other words, the gospel is a message of not only salvation, but restoration, wrongs being made right, real healing taking place, real living, real living. But it may surprise you to find that in the heart of Judaism, during the, the time of Christ, there were those who did not believe in an afterlife or resurrection. They did not believe in rewards or punishments beyond this life. They didn't believe in angels or demons. And most surprisingly of all, they were made up of the high priestly families. The high priest of Israel was the one who was supposed to, to be the spiritual leader of Israel, the mediator between Israel and and God, the only one who was allowed by God to enter into the, the Holy of Holies in the temple once a year to offer the blood sacrifice for the sins of the people. And the priestly families 
that the high priest was chosen from made up this group called the Sadducees. Now, now part of the reason for their narrow views is that they only accepted the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And their claim was that an afterlife, a, a resurrection from the dead, was not taught in those first five books. And it's true that our main proof text for the resurrection in the Old Testament, from the Old Testament, come outside those books. If we want to defend uh, the resurrection of, uh, from the dead from the Old Testament, there are, there are other texts that we usually point to and not in the Pentateuch. Now, there, there, the, the other major political religious party of this day, of course, was the Pharisees. Among, in Judaism, it was the Pharisees. And they believed the rest of the Old Testament was Scripture. Uh, Joshua all the way through Malachi, like we do. And so consequently, they believed in the resurrection along with the majority of Jews and, of course, Jesus, but not the Sadducees. But what the Sadducees and the Pharisees had in common is that they wanted to get rid of Jesus. And so after watching the, the others fail miserably, they thought they would try their hand at it. And so they come to Jesus with a parable of sorts, with a, with a question. And we find it, again, as we read a moment ago in verses 19 through 23. In verse 19, they say, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. So, so what they are referring to there is what is called the, the, the leveret, the leveret law from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. It may be difficult for us to fully understand in our day what's going on here, but in a patriarchal society, which, which, uh, which Israel was, this law would have done a couple of things. First, it would have protected the widow and assured that she is provided for in the loss, after the loss of her husband. But it also preserved, uh, it also preserved the family inheritance. What was so important in, in God's covenant with Israel was his inclusion of, of everyone in an inheritance of land. Because, see, because, because in Israel, the kingdom of God was physical, the possession of land said that you belonged to the people of God. That was the evidence that you were a part of the people of God as you had an inheritance of land in that country. You and your family were assured that land forever. Even if you sold it, you fell on hard times and you sold it because of poverty, you were supposed to get it back according to law. You were to receive that, that land back uh, at the year of Jubilee, which came every 50 years. And so the Leverett Law provided a way for uh, the widow to have a child for her deceased husband by his nearest kin to preserve the deceased husband's inheritance. The equivalent, of course, for Christians is our eternal inheritance, our eternal inheritance that we have been guaranteed in Christ that cannot be taken away from us, which is actually very ironic that the Sadducees would use it, uh, use the, the leveret law here in rejection of the resurrection, but we'll get more into that later on. So in verses 20 through 22, they, they lay out this scenario where there were seven brothers, the first marries but dies without ever having a child. So then the second brother takes the widow as his wife and he dies without having any children as well. And then it goes with all seven brothers. Then finally the woman dies. And in verse 23, the Sadducees think they have their question to stump Jesus and make him look bad in front of everyone and take some of the shine off of him and perhaps even gain a little more support for their view since it was ultimately in the minority among the Jews. And so they ask, in the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as a wife. So it sounds like a great riddle to trap Jesus in, as long as you are assuming certain things about the resurrection, mainly that earthly marriages carried over into the resurrection, which most Jews at that time did believe. Um, if that's the case, then this was, a, this was a really good argument and would trip up, stump most, most Jews. And so Jesus begins to answer them in verse 24. 
And it begins with this. Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. In other words, the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection because they don't know Scripture or the power of God. They only, they only ask such a question because they think they are, they're smarter than they really are. Then in verse 25, Jesus gives some practical explanation of what the resurrection will be like. We'll come back to that later on. And then verse 26, he goes a step further and gives a defense of the resurrection and says, And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. And there, folks, in that last sentence, I think lies the key to this passage. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. If you remember back in chapter 11, what, what has been the theme there? It has been fruit. Fruit has been the theme through, since chapter 11, through chapter 12. On Jesus' way to the temple, if you remember, he curses the fig tree because it produced no fruit as a picture of what was coming next because then he cleanses the temple because the worshipers there were not genuine in producing the fruit of true worship. Then we come to chapter 12 and he tells the parable of the tenants uh, who, who did not give fruit to the landowner when he sent his servant to collect. Even last week, Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. We, we, we are God's. We belong to him. And so just like with the tenants and the landowner, we are to bear fruit. We are to put him as most important and, and, and bear fruit in our lives for, for him. And now we come to this passage on the resurrection. But there's a deeper issue here than just life after the grave. And it's this. Is there life in the hearts of the Sadducees? Is there life in the hearts of the Sadducees? Without life, there will be no fruit. God is the God of the living, yes. But that resurrected life begins in this life. And it's those who possess it in this life that then experience in the afterlife. And that's the issue here, folks. The Sadducees don't believe in the afterlife because they have no real spiritual life in them. And so in his response to the Sadducees, Jesus points out two reasons why the Sadducees demonstrate no spiritual life, why they demonstrate unbelief. They don't know the Scriptures or the power of God. And I think we can use that, folks, to, to, to say in looking at our own lives, if we, have, if we have the new life of Jesus Christ in us, we will know the Scriptures and the power of God. And so those are our two points here this morning. If the new life of Christ dwells within us, we will know this by, by knowing the Scriptures and the power of God. And so I want to unpack that for us here in the time we have left. So we begin with knowing the scriptures. As, as Jesus mentioned after, after or as, I'm sorry, as just mentioned, after Jesus rebukes the Sadducees in verse 24, he, he answers their challenge with two statements. The first is in verse 25 where he says, for when, for when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So in a very practical, straightforward way, he answers the question of the Sadducees. They're not going to, there's not going to be marriage in the resurrection. So, so their question is actually not, not, a, not a real concern. Now, now we'll look more at verse 25 in, in our second point. But verse 26, Jesus turns to the real issue. Marriage isn't the real issue. It's the resurrection. And so then Jesus gives that amazing defense of the resurrection. Again, in a, in a very succinct way like we saw last week. It's, it's really, it's really a, a, a mic drop for, for the Jewish people. In Luke's gospel, actually, some of the scribes who were actually very much against Jesus, they even say after he says this, Teacher, you have spoken well. They give him credit for his, his argument here. But what exactly did Jesus say in verse 26? Well, the first thing to point out is that he used 
the very scriptures that the Sadducees claimed. There were a number of other passages that he could have gone to in the Old Testament uh, to defend the resurrection. He could have used, for instance, Isaiah 26, verse 19, which says, Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. Or there's Daniel 12, verse 2, where it says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So that verse actually shows us that even non-Christians will, will rise from the dead, but only to suffer in judgment for eternity. Then there's, of course, Psalm 16, which we, we read earlier as well. Yet Jesus uses none of these, okay? Instead, Jesus goes to Exodus 3. He goes to Exodus 3. Interesting thing I'd like to point out is that in Jesus' day, the Bible didn't have chapters and verses. And so for you to, to point out a particular passage, you would have to point out something about that passage. And so I love here Jesus just says, you know the passage about the bush, you know? How many times have we not known the actual, uh, the actual chapter and verse where, where something was that we knew about, and uh, we, we didn't want to quote it because we didn't know the chapter or verse? Well, Jesus shows us right here, you can do that. You, know, you don't have to know the chapter or verse. You just know, you know the passage on the bush, you know? You can just uh, refer to it that way. So, and what he points out is how God says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then he says he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, you might argue at this point, you say, oh, okay, I get what, what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is saying God is talking here in the present tense in Exodus 3. He says, I am. So, he, so he's saying, I am the God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're supposed to be already dead at this point. So if he is speaking in the present tense, that means they must still be alive. But Actually, that's not it. That's not. I mean, the, you know, it's implied, but that's not actually what the, the text in its, in its original language says. Instead, the weight of this statement is in the fact that he says he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is where the weight of this, this, this statement is. That is, that, is a, that is about more than just saying he is the creator of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It, it is referring here to his covenant relationship with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As, as the first commandment in the Ten Commandments says, you shall have no other gods before me. He was Abraham and Isaac and Jacob's God. He had a personal relationship with them. Jesus is referring to the fact that God made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he demonstrated throughout their lives his faithfulness in keeping those promises. And those promises particularly in Genesis 17 were referred to as everlasting promises. And so Jesus uses this Exodus 3 passage to defend the resurrection is very it, it, to defend the, the, the resurrection and, and, and in a very simple way, but not an obvious way. There's nothing said about the resurrection here. But what is said is understood that God made an everlasting promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so the question is, why would it end at their death? If God made an everlasting covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and and Jacob, why would it end at their death? I mean, like God would say, it's been nice knowing you, okay? I've been good to you. It's been nice while it lasted, and, and, and that's it? That would, that would seem to make the promises of this, this infinite, limitless God actually very, very finite and limited. It would, it would diminish him. To say that, no, his promises only last during this lifetime, and after that, it's, it's over. No, when, folks, when we enter into a covenant relationship with God, it is with the understanding that he is the one who can do all things and will do all things for those who he has entered into that covenant with. He will provide for us. 
And it's not just, and if it's not just in this life, if certain things aren't provided in this life, well, they must be then in the afterlife. God is faithful. But beyond just the covenant faithfulness of God, there's, there's so much more in the Pentateuch that shouts, folks, life. That it, it, or, or death to life in, in the Pentateuch. For instance, if you go back to Genesis 1, God made life out of nothing. The earth was dark and formless and void, and God spoke and life happened. Death or nothingness turned to, to life. But then sin entered the world, and with that, death in chapters 3 through 6 which led to the, the flood and, 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 and the death of all living creatures on the land. And what came next? Resurrection. The, the flood waters came, came, came down and, and life came forth. And, 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 and then God called Abraham and promised a nation would come from him and, and his wife Sarah. But both were old. Sarah's womb was dead. She had already passed menopause. Yet God brought forth life from her. Then the Lord called Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. And just before he thrust the knife into Isaac, God provided a substitute. And Isaac was given back to Abraham as one who had been raised from the dead. Then Isaac's wife, Rebekah, was barren. And God gave her dead womb life, gave her a child. Then Jacob's wife, Rachel, was barren. And again, God gave life to her womb. She bore a child. And then Jacob thought his son Joseph was dead, having been secretly betrayed by his brothers and sold as a slave to Egypt. But God, again, raised Joseph, in a sense, from, from, the gra from that grave in Egypt and reunited him to his father. Then the nation of Israel looked like they were going to, to die beside the Red Sea. But God parted the Red Sea and raised them up to new life again, in a sense. And the nation of Israel was left in the wilderness due to their sin to die. But the next generation was raised to be brought into the promised land. And so actually, one of the major themes of the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, is how God brings life from death. He resurrects. So no, the Sadducees didn't know their scriptures if they didn't believe in the resurrection. So that is why they too were dead and without life. Now let me explain what I mean by that. Another theme of scripture is that God gives life by speaking, by his words. Okay, God said, let there be life. In Genesis 1, he spoke it and life was created. And it is the same way in a person being given new life, salvation in Christ. God's Spirit works through his word. In Ezekiel 37, for instance, the Lord tells the prophet Ezekiel to preach to a field of dry bones. Dry bones. And when he does, the bones begin to rattle. And flesh starts to form on the bones, and they literally came to life. And when we come to the New Testament, the apostles were sent by Jesus to preach the gospel. And in the same way, people are brought from death to life. And folks, even after becoming a believer, spiritual life and vitality comes from being in the word, hearing the word. And so, and so those who are not in the scriptures receiving the life-giving word are dead. And so if, we, so if we are alive, living, we will be in the word. Okay, if the word is is it, God works His power and gives life to those who hear His word. Okay, and people and there are people who never hear His word, never go to His word. Then the conclusion to that is they're dead, spiritually dead. And so we have to be in the word if we believe ourselves to be. Believers in Jesus Christ, we will be in the Word. And when I say in the Word, I don't mean dull, 
boring. Just do it so you can get in, get, get it in, get your reading in, so, so you can just check that off. And it's not just about memorizing just certain facts. There's a lot of people out there who can, who can quote Scripture and don't have a clue what it actually means. Okay? No, I mean the kind of reading you, you, just, you just saw demonstrated where, where you are thinking through the implications of what you're reading and seeing how it all connects to Christ and, and shows you what, what God is really like. It shows His, his, his character and, and His promises to you and, and warnings to you and, and all the rest. It's reading, it's reading, folks, like your life depends on it. When's the last time you read the Bible as if your life depends on understanding what the Bible says? It's reading that arrests the heart and changes the heart. It's reading that makes you fall in love with Jesus and gives you joy and hope to face each day with faith to be obedient to Christ. So if that is not us, if that is not us, then we may very well be in the same boat as these Sadducees. You see, the Sadducees had their religious structure, but they were dead in their sin. In fact, folks, if we are not in the Word and loving the Word, then we might need to assume we are in the same boat as the Sadducees and repent before it's too late and reaffirm our faith in Christ and confirm it by getting in the Scriptures and again, I don't mean just a daily reading plan where we just go through the motions to say we got, we, we, we got it in. I mean, I mean, we read it with hope, trusting God to speak greater life into us. I mean to seek to really learn it and answer all the questions you have from it. And, and, and the reality is, is if we take that if we come to the Word with that kind of intentionality, it will be life-changing, simply, simply based on time. I mean, you, if, you, if, you would, if you would go to the Word like this, it's automatically going to change your habits, your daily schedule, your electronic intake. It, would, it has to, to have the time to, to, to study the Word this way. It would also cause us to engage our spouse and, in, and children more because we would want to discuss what we are learning and thinking about with, with them and feel a sense of urgency for them to know God's Word as well. We would engage our church members more because we are learning and we've got questions. And so we're, we're, we're going to be talking to each other about that, getting, getting help with that. So... So much would change if we were serious about knowing God's Word. And folks, I'm telling you, the living know the Scriptures and the dead do not. Let me say that one more time. The living, those who have the new life given by Jesus Christ, the living know the Scriptures, the dead do not. That then brings us to our second point. The living know the power of God. Now going back, going back now to verse 25, we skipped it, going back there now. Jesus says to the Sadducees, For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So what Jesus explains in response to the Sadducees' parable about the woman and the seven brothers is that there is no more marriage in the resurrection. So their question is irrelevant. Uh, he says there to be, that we'll be like angels. To be like angels can refer to a number of things. Uh, we see that Luke, the Gospel of Luke, he covers that more, but, but Mark doesn't. So I think the comparison is mainly to say here, for, for Mark's purposes, is to say that, that like angels, we won't, we won't marry either. Angels don't marry, we won't marry in, in heaven. So in the resurrection. Now I know for many of us, this is, this is hard to hear, especially for us who have weathered the storms of life together with our spouse and have, have grown closer through it so that 
We can't imagine life without, without each other. And for those who have lost their spouse in death, you, you take comfort perhaps in the thought that you will see them again. And I believe the scriptures teach that we will see our lost love, I mean our, our believing loved ones, those who, who are with the Lord, we will, we will see them again. But it appears from these words that marriage will not, our relationship with our spouse will not quite be the same. And of course, this makes sense when thinking about what Paul tells us in Ephesians 5, that, 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 is, a, that is wonderful as marriage is between two people, it was designed first and foremost to be a picture of the relationship between Christ and the church. And Revelation 21 tells us that in the resurrection, Christ will dwell with his bride, the church, forever. So, so the, the, the earthly marriage that we experience here on earth is essentially replaced by a heavenly marriage, a marriage between Christ and his people where he dwells with us. So in other words, we are going to be in a whole utterly different and better existence. But the question that we really need to, to deal with here is why did the Sadducees think that this problem they manufactured was a detriment to the whole idea of a resurrection? Because they did not know the power of God. Because they didn't know the scriptures and not only the plans and purposes of God, but his character and faithfulness. They did not know his power as revealed in Scripture. You see, folks, like us, like, like we can be, they were conditioned by this world and their own sin to believe this was all there was. That this life here was all there really was. Without the Scriptures, they could not see the possibilities of what God can do. They were thinking if, if, if it's like this here, then it must be like this in the resurrection if it, were, if it were true. But the question is, why? <laughs> why, why, why is that the case? How, how, how did they know that? How did they come up with that, with that idea or get that assumption about God or, or anything? Do we just think we're that smart? Why couldn't God do something that was utterly different and superior to anything we've ever known? Is that impossible for God? Not according to the Scriptures. When we read the Scriptures, we see that we live in a fallen world waiting to be redeemed and restored to God's original purpose. This world doesn't work right because it has been broken by sin. But what we see time and time again in Scripture is that God works His power to deliver His people. For those who know Christ, who have been given new life in Him, we know that, we know, we know that power from God. We know He can do all things. And if there's something we don't understand, but we know God has promised it, then we simply trust it in God's hands, knowing the power of God. For instance... I don't understand how God is going to resurrect dead bodies that have long ago turned to ashes and gotten remixed into the whole ecosystem again. But should that cause us to doubt it? No. No. Not, not when we know the power of God. So, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Well, if, if you don't, you should certainly because of the urgency. The Bible says that we have all sinned against God and deserve His judgment. Yet in His mercy, He gave us Christ to take the punishment for our sin. By the power of God, through the, the Word of God, we are saved for all who believe and turn from their sins. But even beyond that, is, is that is, is, even though that is the, the ultimate, that is what is most important, the gospel gives us, uh, when, we, when, he say, when we are saved, the gospel gives us a hope and peace like no other. We are assured, as, as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were assured, that God's promises to us are, are everlasting. We can rest in the promise that if he saves us by grace, meaning we do nothing to earn it, given, given to us up front as a gift, then we can never lose it. 
And there is no other joy than the presence of God that, 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 that we, we will enjoy. There's, there's no other joy like the presence of God that we are promised that we will enjoy for forever. And so if this is attractive to you, this, 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 what, what God's word teaches us here, the gospel, that we will be at the doors afterwards to talk to you more about that, about coming a believer in Jesus Christ. But, for, but church, I want to close with this. Do we know the power of God? Do we know the power of God? Again, I am challenged by the negative example of the Sadducees here. I, I think we look too much, or we, or we can look too much like them. They had their religious structures that they depended on and their own abilities to, to manipulate events as we see in their plot against Jesus. In the same way we have other, we, 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 in the same way we have our religious structures. Our, 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 our church government, our theology, our doctrine, our order of service. And so we have everything orderly in place that, that, that we can do, and so, so that we can just kind of do this week after week with or without God. But those who know the power of God don't depend just on their religious structures. Now, don't get me wrong, our, our doctrine, our theology, our, our ecclesiology, all these things are important and, and, and necessary, okay? But, 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 but for those who, who, who truly know, have the life, the, the, the life-giving spirit living in them, they don't just depend on those religious structures. They depend on the power of God to work in us and through us for His glory and our good. We someone who has the life of, of God living in them, the, the life-giving spirit living in them, will pray a lot. We will tap into what we are promised in the, in the power of God. He commands us to pray. So we will pray often, it, it, depending on the power of God, to, to work on our behalf. And with that, folks, we will make choices every day, expecting God to show up big in those choices. We will choose to sacrifice wants, in this life, because we believe by, the, by, by His power, He will give us far more in the resurrection. We spend our, our, our days loving church members, trusting that God will use our efforts to work His power in their lives so that we can finish, so that they can finish the race and attain to the resurrection of the dead. We stick our necks out to witness to the lost, trusting God will eventually lead us to one of His elect and powerfully save them. Uh, we, we choose to work hard for our spouse or children or parents, even when we are tired or sick or depressed because we believe that we, when we are weak, we are strong through the power of Christ working in us. We trust that he can use even our feeble attempts to bring about great things. So Jesus says, folks, as I close, in John 10, verse 10, in reference to his elect that he came to save. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. We've been given a life, folks, to live abundantly. We've been given new life to live abundantly. The scriptures and God's power has been given to us to live that kind of life. So, again, folks, it starts, it starts with, with being in the Word. As we are in the Word, God works His Spirit through the Word to, to change us, to, 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 to build us in our, in our faith. And then out of our under, greater understanding of, of, of God's character and His love and His promises to us, it empowers us then to go out and, and live by faith in, in, in Him and His faithfulness and His power to work in our lives. And when we do that, we, our, our, our lives will be different. They will be fruitful. They will be abundant. Okay? But it, but it, but it, is, it, it comes from, a, it, it, is, is, it is a result of a people who will be given new life, evident. In their, in their love for God's word, their knowledge of God's word, 
and, and their knowledge of his power and trusting and living it out each and every day. And with that, let's pray. Father, thank you for your promises here in your word where we've been able to reflect that, that, um, that you are faithful. You are faithful to your covenant. For all of us who have believed in Christ, we have, we have entered into uh, the new covenant established by the blood of Christ. And you have made promises to us Promises to forgive, promises to, to, um, to, to transform us into the likeness of your Son, to, to give us a, a future and a hope that is secure, to, give, to, to raise us even though we die, that we will rise and live eternally with you. And so, Father, we, we thank you. We, we, uh, we thank you for the assurance that, uh, uh, that we have that we can go to your word and hear from you. And that you do amazing things. You work your grace mightily and uh, in us. We can, we can go with great anticipation to your word and find all we need to, to, to live out the Christian life and, and to find the hope we need to, to, to press on each day. Father, we thank you for the power of God that uh, is given to us in Christ and, and uh, that we can expect you to, to, to show up daily in our lives working your power, and even, even in our weakness, even in our struggles. That is when we are, that's when we are most effective, when we are completely depending on you and not in our own abilities, not in our own efforts. And, uh, and so, Father, we, we trust um, uh, in you, Lord, to continue to, to work mightily um, in, in us as your people, this church, and, uh, and each of us individually. And, uh, and Father, we trust even, even now during this time this morning, Father, that you have worked in the hearts of your people, uh, convicting us of perhaps where we, where we have uh, neglected your word and, uh, the, and, and, and been, uh, been okay with living in, in, in a dry state and, uh, and, 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 and not seeking after the abundant life you've promised us in Christ. And, and uh, Father, um, forgive us. For um, for not living daily, trusting in your in your power to work uh, on our behalf, and so um, and perhaps there's someone here who does not know you as savior, that uh, that um, that you you will work in their in their hearts and uh, and and draw them to you, Father. So we commit all this to you. We trust in you that by by your grace to pour out your your spirit and and give life, give new life, renew life, Father. And, uh, and, and to, to bring glory to your name and good to us. So thank you, Father. And we pray all this in your precious son's name. Amen.